Football, says George Will, has two of the worst features of American life. Violence separated by committee meetings. That's so true, isn't it? I noticed uh, one of the uh, things that our general superintendent mentioned. He was a pastor for, I forget how many years, 18 years was it? Several years. One thing he said he missed was the board meetings. The board meetings. And I forget how many board meetings our, our district superintendent attended this year. It seems like it was 70 some board meetings. Board meetings can really be exciting. Amen. <laughs> Lady was working at the bank. She was employed as a teller. And she said, uh, we were not allowed to eat while working, but one day, um, five months pregnant, she said, I, I, uh, I was so hungry. And she said, I opened a, a bag of potato chips and I started to devour some of them. And she said, just then I spotted one of our best customers and his wife heading my way. And so she said, I quickly wiped my mouth and greeted them. And uh, as I processed their transaction, I noticed they were looking at me oddly. And on their way out, the man said, I don't understand these young people anymore. Dear, his wife said, that's a fashion statement. It's a new type of brooch or brooch. <laughs> I looked down to see what they were talking about. And to my horror, a large potato chip was resting neatly on my shoulder. <laughs> You know, in Texas, they say everything's big. Somebody asked the question, just how big are the mosquitoes in southern Nevada? There was one, I remember, the fellow said. Uh, it was in the papers at the time. Uh, it, it flew into Nellis Air Force Base, and they were about to fill it up with high octane fuel when they realized it had the wrong markings on it. <laughs> Now that's a big mosquito. Amen. One pastor, when he got up to preach, and I thought about doing that this morning, but he said, say hello to our eBay people. That's a joke, in case you don't know. eBay, E church. But we're going to be reading from chapter 19 of 1 Kings. And uh, I want to give you just a little bit of background before we read the scripture. Now, verse chapter 18 is so important as a, an introduction, as a, a foundation for chapter 19. We just went through a long dry stretch here in Indiana and uh, we were complaining it hadn't rained for what? Two months or something, I don't know. Guess what? In Samaria, it had not rained for three years. I mean, they were experiencing a drought. And this was the situation. King Ahab of Syria blamed it on Elijah, the prophet. Well, Elijah did pray, and it wasn't supposed to rain for three years, and God answered that prayer. And so now it's it's almost three years, and uh, King Ahab's out trying to find water for the animals. You know, he's concerned about the animals more than he is the people. But anyway, he's looking for, he's still looking for Elijah because he's blaming him for this drought. And Elijah returns and he runs into King Ahab and he challenges King Ahab to call all the, the uh, he challenges King Ahab and the prophets of Baal and Asherah, 800, uh, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. Uh, Elijah challenges them to a pray down. <laughs> you, you know, uh, whoever can pray the fire down, the people would uh, Turn to. Up to that point, the uh, Israelites, the uh, people of Israel, had been vacillating back and forth. Some for the God Asherah and Baal, and some for the real God. And so Elijah wanted to bring it to head, and so he challenged the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, to warn him. He's got two bulls together. He gave them one of the bulls and he said, prepare your altar 
and pray to your God to answer by fire. So they cut up the, the, bull, the bull, prepared the altar early in the morning, and they began to chant and to pray to their God to answer by fire. And they prayed, and they prayed. And along about noon, Elijah began to taunt them just a little bit. Maybe your God's taking a break. Maybe he's resting. Maybe he's asleep. And they beat themselves, and they cried to Baal, but there was no answer. No answer. So along about three in the afternoon, almost prayer time, Elijah prepared the bull on the altar. He prayed, prepared 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel. He put the bull on there and uh, he dug a trench around it and he commanded the people to water that thing down. They had four big water pots there and he said, fill those water pots and pour it over the altar. Pour it over the bull. Pour it over the wood. Pour it in the trench. And guess what? He did that three times. Three times. I mean, he saturated that. And then he said, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. He said, I'll call upon the name of God and the God that answers by fire. You'll quit vacillating back and forth, but you'll claim him as God. And the people said, that's good. That's good. So Elijah prayed a wonderful prayer. I, let me just read that prayer. Chapter 18, verse 37. Answer me, O Lord. It's not on your overhead. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. And guess what? The fire fell. It burned up the bull. <laughs> it burned up the wood. It burned up the rocks. It burned up the water in the trench around uh, the offering, around the uh, altar. And when all the people said this, they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah commanded that they seize the prophets of Baal. Remember, there's 450 of these. Don't let any get away, he said, and he seized them and had them brought down to Kishon Valley and he slaughtered 450 prophets there. Amen. Amen. And then he told King Ahab, he said, get ready, it's going to rain. Remember, it hadn't rained for three years. <laughs> get ready, he said, it's going to rain and it's poured the rain. That prepares us for chapter 19. Now Ahab, would you like to stand as we read this? Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of those prophets. Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey ahead into the desert. And he came to a broom tree and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid back down. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the Lord and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He said. And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> the Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, I like the way God replied. He didn't answer him in a sense, but he did answer. He said, go out and stand on the mountain. 
in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard, he pulled his cloak over his face. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied with that standard answer he gave earlier in verse 10. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Again, God didn't really answer him directly, but he said to him, go back the way you came and go back to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aaron. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahoah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. And then he answers his question. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. Elisha thought, Elijah thought he was the only one. I reserve 7,000 in Israel and all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Father, we thank you for the life of the great prophet Elijah. And thank you, Lord, that you didn't give up on him. And you didn't answer that wish that he wanted to die. You weren't true with him. Lord, we're so glad that you have a job for each of us. You're not through with us yet, Lord. Some of us feel like we're approaching that, that time when it might be over and we'll be called home. But you're still working on us and through us and with us. Would you continue to have your way? And in this very service, Lord, speak to our hearts. I pray this now in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And amen. What a change in Elijah. Uh, we can only conjecture what happened there. You know, he just had this great victory. I mean, he preached, he prayed that wonderful prayer in the fire pit. He prayed that wonderful prayer and the, the rains came. Uh, all the prophets of Baal were destroyed. They were put to death. And uh, somehow, perhaps in an unguarded show of pride, uh, Elijah, I visualize he must have strutted, strutted around a little bit on the streets of Jezreel in full view. Uh, because after all, everybody knew who he was now. And no longer was he a recluse from the desert. No longer was he obscure, an obscure unsung prophet who was a kind of a legend with his people, but now he was famous. He was notorious, yet uh, unknown firebrand of God who could call fire down and water. Here he was in the flesh and blood out for everybody to see, all the people. And he was where Jezebel could see him as well. And her blood boiled with rage, can't you imagine? Uh, he was out in the open where she could get at him. He was her public enemy, number one. Easy target for her tantrums. He had fallen prey to pride, and now he was in danger, enormous danger. Pride, you know, has its own insidious way of undoing the best of us. And it can lay a giant in the dust of despair in the wink of an eye. Um, it can land any hero in the ditch of despondency in less time than it takes to say these words. Pride leads a person to become so self-preoccupied that all our interest and our attention and all our energy is focused on ourselves and our preservation. And that's what happened to Elijah. This was Elijah's position at the point of danger. One thing did he see, and that was the threat of Jezebel to him. So preoccupied he had become with his own survival, he could no longer see either God or God's hand upon him. And so he ran. He fled. He would not face Jezebel. Think about it. He faced 450 
prophets of Baal. And I don't know how many, well, there were at least 400 Asherah, Asherah prophets. He faced all of them. And now he ran from Jezebel. He was overwhelmed. He was engulfed with fear and foreboding. He was kind of like a, a hunted hare. He took his servant lad and he ran. He departed the city, running as hard as he could, and he headed south for the desert waste beyond Beersheba. Elijah's faith in God was gone. Here he is, this great man who could pray down fire and water. His confidence that right would win was shattered. Elijah's assurance that Jehovah was God was shaken. And the focus of his, ten, his, his attention was no longer on what God could do, but on what he, Elijah, the cunning, the skilled desert no man could do. He had to save himself, so he ran. The focus of his attention was no longer on what God could do. Elijah was falling back on his own survival skills, his own desert expertise, his own outdoor experience. He had allowed the threat of Jezebel to come between him and his Lord. The circumstances of his crisis had come between him and God. And he saw now that he could only see his own peril, his own danger, not the possibilities or potential power in the hand of God on his person. Think about it. We all do this sometimes, don't we? Often in sudden unexpected crises, our eyes are diverted from God, the power of God, and the presence of Christ to the threatening circle of our circumstances, closing in around us, hemming us in, and our faith fails, and we want to run as Elijah did. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46 was a favorite psalm of Martin Luther, as well as David, I suppose. He lived in very turbulent times. And uh, that still small voice of God sometimes is drowned out. Many times we not only have external noises, noises all around us, but we have internal voices, noises of criticism and defeat that plague us. Somebody said silence is golden. Now, we don't like silence, really, do we? If we were to stop, if I were to stop right now and stand for 60 seconds, it would seem like an eternity. We'd begin to swarm. Uh, but silence can be good. Silence, remember, is not the absence of sound as much as it is an attitude of the heart. Man went to the monastery where you take a vow of silence. I may have shared this in the past, I'm not sure. But every 10 years, he was invited to, to say something, to utter a word. And so at the end of that first 10 years, he said, bad, hard. Another 10 years went by. He said, food, bad. Another 10 years went by. He said, I quit. The head of the monastery responded to his third remark by saying, I'm not surprised. You've been complaining ever since you've been here. <laughs> silence, the vow of silence. Silence is not the absence of sound as much as it is an attitude of our hearts. And there is a silence that pushes aside the complaining, negative words of the world in order that we hear the positive words of God. Psalm 46, there's a powerful picture of clamoring nations here. And that's, that's what the psalmist finds himself in the middle of. And he, he records that scripture, be still and know that I am God. Leslie Brandt paraphrased that scripture, saying it this way, relax, stop fretting, and remember, I'm still God. I'm still your God. I still hold the reins of this world of yours. I recently paraphrased that same verse and I said, God probably said it this way, shut up <laughs> and listen. Sometimes we have to be awakened or jarred, don't we? There's a great illustration from scripture that lifts us out of the power of silence in our lives. Elijah had had, he had just come through tremendous success, calling down fire from heaven, destroying those prophets of Baal. 
ending a drought of three years. And he was at the top of his game, actually, as a prophet. And yet, here we see him running for his life and wishing he could die and hiding in a cave. Elijah, the great prophet. E. Stanley Jones tells of a guru who developed a tremendous following. He was really famous. And E. Stanley Jones decided he would look, look this man up, seek him out. And he went to the cave where the, the fellow was staying. And as E. Stanley Jones, great missionary, walked in, the, the guru said, uh, I have not thought of a woman in 40 years. E. Stanley Jones responded by saying, isn't it interesting? That, that, that's the first thing he said, uh, what, that he would mention that. Well, Elijah was in the back of a cave, not thinking of a woman, Jezebel. <laughs> Joke. It's amazing how often we use silence as an attempt to escape our problems. Yet they keep filtering back into our minds through silent arguments. The first point, if you're taking notes, the world of noise. We live in a world of noise. There's noise, commotion all around us. We live in a world filled with noise and empty words. And they take their toll on uh, the human spirit uh, that is seeking for God. Elijah needed God, the presence. First, we have the noise all around us. Multitude of noises, billboards, uh, TV programs, I should add the internet, Facebook, uh, all the various things that we are, noise all around us. There are all kinds of books that are printed and, and uh, probably more books than there ever was in the past. And yet we, they have less meaning than any other, any other time in history. And we live in a world of noise, negative sounds, and they are so noticeable. Elijah heard the threat of an angry woman. Look back at verse 2 in our reading, chapter 19. She said, may the gods deal with me. She sent a message to him, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I don't make your life like one of them. What was their life like? No, well, they were dead. She was going to kill him if she got the chance. And so he heard that threat. And it's amazing how criticism and threats and angry words can take their tolls on a person who's been bombarded with all the sounds all around us. Elijah had been listening to, remember in chapter 18, how he listened for hours to those prophets of Baal. A lot of noise, crying. They flogged themselves. They brought blood on their backs. They cried out to Baal, but there was no answer. He had listened to all this. And as your mind is filled with the noise of the world, our, our defenses against negativism are weakened. So it took its toll on Elijah. There was that noise all around him. And then there are the noises within us. Far worse than the criticism of others is our own self-talk, our own self-criticism that many people live with constantly. Elijah was angry with himself in his own life. Go back again to verse 4. Remember, he uh, was feeling sorry. He was having self-pity. Um, and he said, I've had enough. Verse 4 and 5. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. So he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. He was actually wanted to die. He did everything but take his own life. Um, Self-talk, self-criticism. His dream had died. Remember, he thought, probably, when he prayed down the fire and the prophets of Baal were destroyed and, and the people said, we'll serve God, he thought they're going to have a real revival. Amen? Uh, and things were going to look up. It was going to be a new age of revival. And now, he felt like a failure. The noise in his own soul overwhelmed him. And then there's... Not only the noise around us and the noise within us, but there is the noise that destroys. There's another kind of noise that can destroy you, and he came close to the edge. His bitterness and self-pity became evident. Remember those two verses, 10 and 14? 
He said, I, I'm, I've been zealous and I've done this and that, but you've killed all the prophets with the sword. Now you're up here wanting to kill me too. Uh, he was ignoring the past successes of God and the prosperity of God in his own life. And he focused totally on the hurt and the destructive elements all around us. Oh, how many times we do that. We focus in on the problems, the circumstances all around us. This kind of noise can destroy a great man and it can destroy us as well. Secondly, we see that God knows, you know, God, Jesus is a great physician. We call him the great physician. He's also the great psychiatrist. <laughs> you ever think about that? He's the great psychiatrist. There is a therapy of silence. God knew what Elijah needed. And so he reminded him and us by that great song, Be Still, Shut Up, and Listen. God has to jar us sometimes. God gives physical therapy. He created the body. He knows how to care for it. He instructed Elijah to get a good night's sleep first, eat a good breakfast, then sleep some more. Kind of like that schedule, don't you? <laughs> and then he sent him on his way. Human beings are physical. There are limitations to what our bodies can withstand. And God is the great physician and he wants to help us take care of our bodies. Then he gave him psychological help. He also created our minds. Remember that. He knows how to soothe our minds. And uh, it's not by accident that God led Elijah through the desert to Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb. What do we know about Mount Horeb? This was a mountain where Moses got the Ten Commandments. It was a mountain filled with memories of Moses, the giving of the law, the dwelling place of God. When God spoke, the people were scared to death and the animals were not even supposed to come up on the mountain. He was remind, reminding Elijah that you're just a man, uh, but you are a man of dignity and worth and you are important. Sometimes God has to get us quiet to remind us we belong to him and we are important. He does love us. So he gives him psychological therapy. And then he gave him a little spiritual therapy. God didn't speak out of the earthquake. Think about it. It was such a fierce earthquake that the, rock, the rocks were shattered on the mountain. Think about it. I got a little uneasy the other night when we had that <laughs> tornado spot. Didn't you get a little uneasy? God was not in this earthquake. No, he wasn't in the fire and the thunder either. But the word of God came through silence. It was the still, small voice that came to Elijah. Have you heard the still, small voice lately? Elijah was a man of fire, acting, uh, earthquake, cr crumbling rocks. But God knew he needed the still, small voice. A new experience. Yeah, it was a missing note in Elijah's life. Gentleness, quiet, silence. God knows what we need in our spirits. Amen. Sometimes we just need to be shut up and be still. Sit quietly and listen to the word of God. Thirdly, there are rewards of silence. There are certain things that we can learn in times of silence can be acquired really no other way, no other place. In silence, we can see God's plan. Elijah had to see that God wasn't through with him. He still had a plan for him. In verses 15 and 16, remember, he gave him a job to do, didn't he? Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. Anoint Hazel. Anoint Jehu. Anoint Elijah. He had a lot of things for him to do. Amen. He was still going to be really active. And then he reminded him about the 7,000. Elijah had to see that God still had things for him to do. It's a sign of maturity. Discouragement. We all get discouraged at times. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be defeat. Amen. We all get discouraged. We don't have to be defeated. 
We can be struck down, but not destroyed. In silence, our spirit grows. And in silence, we see God's ultimate triumph. Um, verse 17, when you lose sight of the ultimate victory, your own spirit is defeated, but it's through silence that you learn to guard, guard your heart. Silence keeps the fire burning. It keeps hope alive when we listen to God. And in silence, we see that God's in control. Be still and know that I am God. Elijah saw that God was still working through many people in many situations. And so as he was sent back to the people uh, who still believed in God, he had to have a message or something to share with them. And these people still needed a leader. And uh, it's a fact that out of silence, God gives us something worth doing or saying. God wants to help us continually grow. Remember, he didn't save us to stay static. Amen. Um, you're either getting better or bitter, somebody said once. We're either growing or we're not. He saves us to grow, to become that that he has in his mind for us. He wants to guard our relationship with him and he wants to increase our service to others by filling us with good things to say, good things to share. Do you have anything good to say? We can brag on God, can't we? Amen. What did he do for you? Did he save you? Did he change you? We have that story, don't we? This comes through the discipline of silence. Elijah, or I should say Isaiah, talks about waiting on the Lord in chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall walk and not faint. This is scripture that Elijah needed. There's not much thrill sometimes in walking. Elijah was used to running. Fire. Answer by fire. Storm. That was Elijah's uh, motive for and die. There's no thrill sometimes in being quiet or walking. It's, uh, it is the test of stable qualities to walk and not faint. Um, the word walk is used in the Bible to express the character. Remember, John saw um, Jesus as he walked, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So there's never anything abstract in the Bible. It's always vivid and real. God does not say, Be spiritual, but he says, Walk before me. Follow me. There are always uh, instruction for us. When we are in, in an unhealthy state physically, which Elijah was, or emotionally, which Elijah was, we always want thrills. In the physical domain, this will lead to counterfeiting the Holy Ghost. In the emotional life, it leads to inordinate affection and the destruction of morality. And in the spiritual domain, if we insist on getting thrills, on mounting up with wings, it will end in the destruction of spiritual. We need to walk to experience the presence, uh, the very presence of God. At critical moments, it's necessary to ask for guidance, but it ought to be unnecessary, necessary to always be saying, oh Lord, direct me here or there. Of course he will. That's part of being a Christian, but, uh, if our common sense decisions are not, are not his, not what he wants, not his order, he will press through them and, and check us and we have to get quiet and wait for the direction of his presence. I, I'm reminded when I talk about getting quiet and listening and waiting uh, of the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Jesus, before he went back to heaven, said, I, I have to go. And if I go, I'll send the comfort to you. But he said, you need to wait and tarry. And so they did. He said, uh, tarry ye until. Wait on God and he'll work. But uh, somebody said, don't wait in spiritual sulks. Don't pout because you can't see an inch in front of you. We don't always see what God has in store, do we? As we... Uh, as are we detached enough from our own spiritual hysterics to wait on God? Remember, it's hard to wait 
But that word wait is not just to sit. Amen. We're waiting for his coming again, but don't just sit there. Amen. We want to take as many with us as we can. Don't sit with folded hands, but learn to do what you're told. God has a message for you, a job for you to do. It's told of St. Francis of Assisi that uh, he went with a young man in the town to preach for the day. And on the way, they helped a woman carry a large burden to market. They found a farmer who needed help repairing his cart. A little later, they discovered a sick child who needed to be cared for. It wasn't long before the day was over. And uh, the great spiritual leader was heading back home, back to the monastery. And the young man was discouraged. He said, Francis, I thought we were going to preach today. And the man of God said, we have been preaching all day. We have been preaching. You may not be a preacher. You may not have a license. <laughs> you not, may not be ordained. You may not be pastoring. But you're preaching every day by the way you live. Amen. Um, remember, there's a message in silence that's deep and strong. There's a demonstration of love and care that words will tend to mar. Let God minister through you. And don't get discouraged. Even the great Elijah got discouraged. But God brought him out. God the great physician. God the great psychiatrist. God the great spiritual leader will bring us through. Amen. Bless your hearts. I hope God has touched you in some way. Would you stand with me? And pray for the pastor. And Ashley, as they experience a few days of relaxation. And uh, maybe they'll come back refired uh, and ready to go. Our Father, we do love you. And we thank you for uh, the words of Scripture. Thank you for the living word that you've given us to live by. Everything we need is in the Word. Um, it's by the Word that we were created. By the Word that the worlds were created. It's by the Word that we uh, continue to live victoriously. Now, Father, I pray that uh, you'd speak to our hearts. If there be one, one here today that's discouraged or down, help the Lord be reminded that, <laughs> as you reminded Elijah, Elijah there were 7,000 <laughs> faithful and he thought he was the only one and you had to tell him so father remind us remind us uh, that we're not the only ones and that you're in the battle with us you're in the fight with us have your sweet sweet way now we pray in the mighty name of jesus go with us help us to be victorious in your name we ask amen, amen. you are dismissed